Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, what can adults do to make the pain a child feels after losing a parent a little more bearable? And I'm in conversation with Ian and Phoebe Gilbert. Hi, my name is Ian Gilbert. Uh, I set up a company called Independent Thinking nearly 28 years ago to work primarily with young people around thinking skills, learning and motivation and memory and creativity. Uh, And over the years that transformed into an organisation that supports schools around the world in in all sorts of areas uh, to help schools be better at doing what they do and help education do its job of of making the world better. Um, that, that, That life um it's sort of divided into two in many ways the first part of those years uh, was working in the uk and having children having a family and then um things changed uh, drastically and the second part of that life uh, from an education from a work point of view i've worked in lived and worked um uh, in various parts of the world in the middle east in south america in asia um uh, and now partly spend my time partly in wales where i'm speaking from now in, in glorious isolation um, and also in Rotterdam. So that's, uh, that's the, in a nutshell, that's, that's me. <laughs> My turn. So I'm Phoebe, I'm Ian's uh, daughter. Um, I'm a recent graduate at Hallam University in Sheffield. Um, I have done a few of the books of my dad concerning loss, which came after we lost my mum at the age of nine. Um, from this, I felt really inspired more recently as I grew older to, to make a change around loss. And then I am now the founder of Kutchi Care. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I'm stuck on where to go. <laughs> tell us what, <laughs> what, what Kutchi is. Yeah, tell, tell me about Kutchi um, Care. So Kutchi Care, a Kutch is a Welsh term um, and it's one of the terms that genuinely got us through our most rubbish days after we lost mum. It's more than a cuddle, you know, that if if one of us is in need of a cutch, it's just to be held and to be in such a safe space. So I wanted to kind of create that physically so that people who are struggling could have that, um, have that whenever they needed it really. So that is what a cutch is and that is what Cutchy Care is trying to do at the minute. So that's where my my focus has been on. We'll explore. I, I love the word kutch. It's one of my favourite words in all the world. So uh, people listening in from uh, anywhere really other than Wales, a kutch, I think, is it C-W-T-C-H? Is that how yeah. you spell it in English? Um, and yeah, it's a word that was introduced to me uh, by by colleagues in Wales. And yes, I, I think that's wonderful that you've named your, your business. I think we all need a kutch on some days, don't we? So. 100%, most definitely. So our episode question, and we definitely want to learn more about Kutchi Care later on, so I'm banking that question, Um, but the episode question today is, what can adults do to make the pain a child feels after losing a parent a little more bearable? Um, And Ian, maybe if you wouldn't mind um, kicking things off with your first thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. That is such an important question. Um, when, When we lost my wife, Leslie, um, all those years ago, I can't wait, we'll lose track of the times. So 12 years ago, Phoebe, I, oh, 13. 13, I can't remember. Um, it, it, th- there's nothing that, there's nothing schools can do. The quick answer to that is nothing. It, the pain is there for everybody, for every member of the family. In our situation, we'd battled um, with my wife's mental health issues for many, many years. So, so there was the turmoil of living with somebody with mental health issues and the unpredictability and the stress levels that that brings to the house. Um, And if anybody's heard me say this on another platform, any other platforms, and I I apologize, but it's worth saying this idea that that the the family suffer the illness in a different way, but they suffer the illness and they don't get the attention and the care. And certainly we didn't get any care or any support. We don't get the medicine. We don't get the sympathy. We just have to deal with whatever, whatever happened. Um, so it was incredibly, we had an incredibly stressful life and childhood was, 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 was robbed. Uh, so Phoebe's my youngest. Um, Olivia is, you've got to help me with the ages, Phoebe. Olivia 25. is what age? <laughs> 25, 26 now. Okay. So there's sort of five, five years difference. And then William is 31. So he was five years again, different. So at the time then, William was at college and he was, well, the last time he saw his mum was on his 18th birthday. Um, And Olivia was so 13 and you were nine. So we had 
infant school as it was then. We were living in Suffolk, uh, uh, secondary school and um, college. So, so the, all schools in their different ways had helped or not us through the illness part of it. And then suddenly there was this, which in many ways was a shock for everybody because so much of it is hidden with mental health, um, especially issues around alcohol and abusive, abusing substances and things. Um, there's so much that there was then, so much shame and so much denial. Um, I'm not a huge royalist, but one of the things that I'm most thankful to Princes Harry and William for is that they started talking about mental health, which meant it got into the Daily Telegraph, which meant other families could talk about these issues. It suddenly the, the stigma went, whereas we were dealing with something that you had to keep hidden. Um, and then, the, and then when the death, it was a tragic accident. But when that happened, it, it there was a peace that fell. That's my perception. If Phoebe can can give her perspective perspective as well, but there was a peace that fell. Yeah. because of the stress from what happened before which was then also met with the most terrible pain and and there isn't anything that anybody can do to to take that pain away and what people what what, what I noticed or what we all noticed the response was people either did something or did nothing and something is always better than nothing um those who said I didn't know what to say so I didn't say anything I think I refer to that in what what became our little book of bereavement and is now independent thinking on loss because we updated it because I wanted them to see the hope and the positivity and the possibility for children as they get older through this but I just saw that as a form of moral cowardice I, I don't know what to do so I'm not going to do anything it's just that's 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 the worst possible thing do something you can make a cake you can say hello you can send a card you can send a bunch of flowers you can you can do something and something is better than nothing so I think I think that's that's probably the starting point for this conversation. What can schools do? It's to do something and not hushed and not pretend it hasn't happened and not not discuss it and not support the parent, the remaining parent as well. And whereas I got a bit of support from some parts of that, those that three tiers of education in other places, I just got sympathetic looks and people avoiding me. Um, you know, in the in the school when I went. So, you know, you just you got to. It's the hardest possible thing, and nothing you can do is going to help. But you got to do something. So, I think that would be the starting point for 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 that. My answer to that question, Pookie. It, what do you think, Phoebe? I think from you following on and saying, you know, do something. Those people who say, well, they didn't know what to do, so they chose to do nothing. I think it comes from a fear of making it worse. But you can't make it worse. The truth is, with we're experiencing the worst thing. We'd much rather you do something and get it. It's not even wrong, I don't think that's the right term, but not. maybe it's not gonna take anything away, but at least it's something. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's the perfect place to start. And, and schools were so essential in all of this because all three of us were in school. Um, and school is where I found out mum had, mum had passed away. Olivia found out mum had passed away. And so I just, yeah. I don't think you can take it away, but there is so much that can be done. I think that for me, it was being there and remembering. People need to just remember. And if you can remember specific days or birthdays, you just by giving me a, another look or a cuddle, it will just take take some of it away, I think. I think that's that's there's an ongoing there's, there's what what to do immediately. And mm. then there's that ongoing thing. And I think schools and people and humans can get it wrong. But maybe not the right word, but not 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 do what was needed at the time at that precise time and then over time even those who did get it right then sometimes feel that okay well you've moved on or I don't want to reawaken an old wound or and and that shows an understanding but maybe we can sort of come back to that if, if I can just go back to that that day Phoebe said you know she found out about it at school so so I'm in the position on that day where I've now got to go to tell my three children what has happened um my son weirdly was at Alton Towers so I'm and, and we've always talked about life being a roller coaster and a roller coaster being better than the teacups and the teacups <laughs> just go round and round and they're perfectly safe but you know at the end of the day who wants teacups the roller coaster is it's it you know peaks and troughs happy is happy very happy very sad sometimes hashtag happy sad all at the same time <laughs> so we'd always talked about that and then the fact that William was actually my son was actually at Alton Towers about to go on a roller coaster and I had to text him. This is before WhatsApp. This is just text on mobile phones. 
you know, just can you come home and and well, what's happened and just come home and he needed needed to know and so I could uh, I had to tell him that way, so he's on his way back and then I had to go to um, Olivia Secondary School, and I remember just you know I need my daughter to come out of the lesson and I need somewhere to talk to her because of this is what's happened, and they had no space they had nowhere no front office no nowhere near that we could be private nobody was prepared to sort of leave their office. For ten minutes, while I well, I, I, I ended up living was brought to me at the front, and then I had to walk halfway through all these corridors, through halfway through a school to these down these corridors with her going, "What's what's going on, Dad? What's going on?" To find a space mm. to close the door, to then tell her, and then leave the school, and and that that was that was um, and that was awful. Mm. Just you know, when you know when when the front of office staff know what's happened, you know you you're going to find a office somewhere. To, 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 to free up that sort of space. And in Phoebe's school, which was a, a lot smaller, so an infant school, um, that's what happened. You know, the, the head teacher had left her office, so I had that space um, and then was able to sort of speak to the head teacher afterwards. So it's just, it, it might sound like a little thing, but having a school, having some sort of procedure by which when there is some bad news to be broken, that there is a procedure that will allow that to happen quickly and safely and securely with the minimum of first not dragging my daughter by a hand through halfway through the middle of a school so there's 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 those little things that you yeah you wouldn't really think of mm -hmm. um until you go through it and then you realize that they are that they are important and i think that's one of the things why we wanted to write this book we'd seen a program um probably i don't know five six months after after leslie died where um uh, it was John Craver's news round, I think, but it was, wasn't it? And it was people. T it was set in Bristol, and they were talking about grief and loss, and and how it was hard to talk. It was children talking about it, and we thought, well, we've got we've got an experience. Let's put we just put a, like an A4 sheet together of of I don't, I don't know ten things, twelve things we think schools got right, schools got wrong. This is was useful, and that's what then became the book, um, which was a little book of bereavement for schools with a pebble on. And I'll let Phoebe talk about the pebble and the puddle in a minute. Um, and then we've just updated it as now as we've got a new for independent thinking press, which is the independent thinking series of books, independent thinking produce. Uh, we've got independent thinking on loss, which is the core of the book is the same as the bereavement book. I didn't want to update. I don't want to go back into there and update that because it was a, a place in time and it was raw and personal and it needed to be that way. But what uh, what in the new book, what's happened is I've updated the forward with a bit more of the research now that there, there is more research in this area, especially by Winston's wish with Cambridge University, we can perhaps come back to that. So maybe bank, bank that question as well, Pookie. Yeah, I'm um, banking it. <laughs> um, 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 but also that, you know, because if that was written 10 years after the event, then I wanted, I wanted my kids to write a new forward and where they were in their lives now with Phoebe she was at university and Williams in Dubai and Olivia's in Melbourne and they're all they're all good they've all been through it they're all raw and they're all hurt and they're all damaged but they're all good and that's okay because one of the things I didn't realize is that, that what the research did show was that a child who's bereaved is things like more likely to live in on the streets more likely to drop out of education more likely to be on alcohol more likely to be on drugs more likely to be on cigarettes more likely to die early I, I think i said living on the streets and then if you throw in um mental health issues at home throw in alcohol issues at home and then all of those things are compounded so the statistics point to all three of my kids should have should be not in the good place that they are that they are now and i think that's one of the things maybe we can sort of touch on how what schools can do to help the, the the remaining parent that sort of work work towards that, um, but yeah, the research shows that that and, and they don't even feature in the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. Losing a parent isn't one of the ten. No um, divorces, I think, isn't it? Separation. Divorces and abuse and sexual abuse and violence and witnessing all of that. So you know, some terrible things are, but 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 the fact that just just losing a parent, you know, you don't hit an ACEs aware school is is means that we need to embrace the aces but know that it's not uh complete and that just because they don't hit those buttons that that, that point score if you like that, that there's nothing to see here what are your thoughts phoebe kind of hearing that from your dad that you know on paper your prospects shouldn't have been great but here you are today and you're telling us about your new venture and i think it means that we're doing something right <laughs> that we've done we've done something right. And I think it all led from 
uh, just from being honest and speaking how we are now we we are open we want to speak to people about it because it's it's going to be the best way forward i think in the uk especially part of our society we find death a really uncomfortable topic whereas i think how open we are from before mum died and all the way through during and after we were honest and i think that's what has got us here why we have gone completely the opposite way of where statistics have said we should be um and i think it's i think it's about having a unit and having people that you can rely on and that's going to be school because that's where we are most of the time but also your family and your friends and those people that that can help i think that's where what we should look at the support network that we can have around us more and One schools thing. schools have a part to play in that as well yeah. so when i talk about the extent to which the schools were supportive of the yeah. remaining parent it's it's such it's hard to explain but, but but you know when you've got two parents or two carers that's 50 50 and then when it's down to one it feels like a whole lot more than just double <laughs> it, it's it's an incredible challenge i suppose and, and there are all that sorts of stress involved in it as well as dealing with your own grief and and what you can do with your own life there's all of that so anything the school can do to support that remaining parent in their support of the children is worthwhile so my son's college they were great they they you know that his tutor had me in with will and they went through his grades and went through his target grades and went through what was needed and it was all it was incredibly caring but it wasn't cuddly you know it, it was we want to support you this is what needs to happen in order for william to fulfill his potential at this college and move on and it was exactly what was what was needed it was it was it was precise it was firm it was academic it was caring it was professional and it was just 100 percent 100 percent right and he got those grades and well this is where you get have the situation where you know he probably wouldn't have got those grades dealing with the chaos of of mm. what had to be going on before his mum died but that sense of peace and the chaos went we just were left with the with the pain and that that's you can deal with that um so he was able to focus on his studies and then get to durham university and, and sort of go on go on from there and, and and you know set out on his life really so that 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 level of support of the parent i would suggest is it helps and and to for the school to be aware of what who else the parent remaining parent has got the support of and the children got the support of so in our case it was my my parents you know that 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 it, it, when you've got a world of chaos the, the rocks are important yeah um, not the pebbles we'll go back to that phoebes but the, but mm -hmm. the rocks the, the things that don't move the things yeah. that the chaos spins around and uh and and yeah for, for for us it was you know my my parents were all the way through that and and still are <laughs> they still are my mum's just we've, because we've opened up the border between england and wales at this point in our history now uh, I, I can see my mum for the first time in eight months so she's out in the garden now sort of uh, but she's <laughs> still there so looking after us okay. which is good the, the pebble fever so just i keep talking about that yeah, I was going to say, we need to know about the pebble. If you want to join in, Kooky, at all, just, just let no, us know. No, it's fine. I'm happy just listening. You go for it, <laughs> I have to kind of get into the zone. So the all of this stuff is in my little box in my head. So I'm just listening to you as well, Dad, and just getting back yeah. into all of it, yeah. as it's quite a difficult one to touch. But it, we, it needs to be touched upon. Um, I think we've learned that there are specific terms that have helped us in our family. So Kutch being one and I absolutely love it and I still use it. Um, but pebble and a puddly day is two of the things that I wouldn't have to communicate with dad and say, I'm really, you know, I'm having an awful day. I could just say I'm having a puddly day and that was it, you know. Um, so pebble came from the pebble in my pocket. It was from when I remember kind of going through it when I was little and how I still see it. And I share it with a lot of my other friends who have also lost someone close to them. You know, it's, it's in your pocket, it's always there. You can always, pick it out it's the grief is there you can pick it out and you can look at it and you can you know be with it when you need to but you can put it back put it back down I think that's kind of still how I see it tell me if I'm if I've kind of mixed up yeah. that from being it, nine to now <laughs> no no we spoke at a conference I was asked to speak at a conference in North Wales I think and I asked you and Olivia if you wanted to come along and um I think was it both did both of you come along to that yeah, one I think such a long time yeah. ago and that was the first time that we sort of spoke openly about and it was an audience of teachers and social workers and and one of the teachers there one of the delegates talked about the pebble that it was something it's you, you feel it it's a lump it's uncomfortable mm. but you don't have to have it in your hand the whole time but you can pull it out and take it out and you it might be 
hourly or daily or every other day and it's there and then you can sort of you put it away again so that's where that came from which is why we put the pebble yeah on, when we did the original book on there but then the puddle that was from the um uh it was uh, olivia had a big thing where she wanted school is school and home is home so whereas phoebe and her infant school was happy to for the school to be a little bit more aware of what was going on at home both before and after as he died and have the support and the care and know that there could be time out and that this is what's going on um olivia just wanted to go to school and not have any of that sort of stuff just school is school and home is home and that's what we want and and one of the things because i wanted to make sure they were getting whatever support they felt they needed i went with um, her to the local doctor service just to speak to the, the like the counselor there but it was away from school and this is one of the things the counselor said it was the children grieve in puddles, adults grieve in rivers, children grieve in puddles. So do you want to explain that one, Phoebe? For me and, and the way I use it and the way I feel it still to this day is that, you know, for me, a puddle, I'm going to go in it. If I'm going to go in it, I'm not going to drown. I'm not going to not be able to get back out of it. I can get back out of it. But for the time being, when I'm in it, I feel it and it's rubbish and I hate, I still hate a puddly day but you can always get out of it. Whereas it was adults grieving, what was it, dad, rivers? Rivers, yeah, it's, just, it's a constant. Continuous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I thought like for me, it's, it felt more like waves, to be honest. You, you, I remember writing about it at the time, you just, it's like you're standing on a shore and just suddenly this wave, just, you know it's coming and it just washes, there's nothing you can do, it just washes over you and then it sort of, it'll recede and then another one's gonna come. At some point, could be while you're driving the car, could be in the supermarket, could be in the middle of the night, could be out walking the dog. It just, it just, that, it's that sort of relentlessness um, about it. But yeah, the puddle is, it's like you're in it and then you come out. But the one of the, again, back to that original question, what can schools do? It's helping, helping children, other children, especially young children, well, no, all children really know that that's okay. Because what I remember Phoebe coming back from school, you know, really upset one of the days, not long afterwards. And, and, and it was, I think it was in the changing rooms, wasn't it, Phoebe? And it was, you know, well, I don't, you know, you, you're lying. Your mum hasn't died because you're not crying. Yeah. And that, do you want to explain that one a bit more? Yeah, it, yeah, it was because, because I think they just expected if, if someone you knew had died, if your mum had died, that that was it, life was over. You, you've got to be a mess, you know, but it wasn't. And to be honest, at the age of nine, how I dealt and felt grief then compared to throughout the years, it, it wasn't a case of crying all the time. It, that's just not how it works, especially at such a young age. You can't really comprehend what's happening. So you have a moment where you feel it and it's awful. And then a moment where you just want to be nine again. And I just wanted to be young and I just wanted to have my friends and play in the playground. But the fact that someone had taught that girl that it was OK to say, you're not, you're not. Yeah, she's not dead. You're not crying or wherever she got that thought from at such a young age. Is just yeah beyond me and that is what I just want to change around it grief isn't just someone miserable it's so much more it's it's this it's us moving on and not you know we haven't forgotten mum and I still miss her but you you move and you you live and you you laugh again and then we get to nine plus one which is another term but there's just so much more to it than just your mum's not dead because you're not crying I think that's something that um I, I end up having to remind adults often when you know how we support children is it can seem a little bit perplexing and 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 sometimes you know to a remaining parent that a, a child might be really deeply upset at the loss of a parent but then the next minute they're laughing and that can feel very difficult as an adult to to understand um but i do think it's it's really important and actually children probably as the nine-year-old in the family you were the best placed to process that grief in a normal and healthy way because you hadn't yet had society telling you how one should uh, mm. should grieve what what do you think your school could or should have done or, or schools could do now to support children to support their peers because presumably in that situation how your friends did react and the things that they did did and said to you and with you would make a big difference to your ability to manage what do you think children need to know and be taught about this so I I was weirdly one of the lucky ones out of us three my school at the time um was just brilliant so they gave dad the space to kind of break the news and they then sent us flowers um, they then did a little class with all of my peers and made all of my peers make a card um to which i still have all of them um 
and that for me it wasn't that wasn't just about the support that I had and how loved I felt and how you know touching it was but that also taught those nine-year-olds how to respond to grief throughout the rest of their lives yeah. um so I can never ever fault that but there were other schools um where I was made to sit in a mother's day assembly um wow and I just remember people, just the looks that you got, not because people were being mean, but it's that look of, you know, when people are looking at you thinking, oh, is she crying yet? Is she, does she realise that it's Mother's Day Assembly and she hasn't got one? She should be in here. Um, so there are just places, schools that some did it right and some didn't. And I've been in 16 different schools now. And I think schools where you join and you haven't lost your parent whilst you were there, think that it's not their issue and it's not their problem. Wow. And they need to be reminded that actually you are one of their students. You come with a history like everyone else does. And they need to work out how to support you individually. You know, it's not just one framework. And I will, I will, I think I've said this before, but for me and my sister, if we were in the same school, it shouldn't be the same framework. How everyone grieves is different. And we need to make adaptions and talk. That is what we need to be doing. We need to talk. We need to talk to the child. We need to talk to the, the, la the parent that's been left. There's so many different people in this. It's not just, right, here's the framework. Here's what we're going to do. I've helped you. I've done what I needed to do. You should be fine now. Off you go. There's yeah. so much to it. Grief doesn't just end, does it? And no. no. What, what, so uh, some of the schools then, they thought it wasn't their issue. But what about schools that got it right? What did it look like when they, they got it right? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> um, when we finally got to one that got it right, I think it was the remembering of uh, specific days. So my form tutor when we were in Hong Kong was just uh, brilliant and, and finally got, you know, grasped a hold of what she needed to do. And it was, you know, have a cuddle. And in UK schools, I don't think you'd probably do that with your teacher, but this teacher was so lovely and she did remember. And that was one of the most important things was just finally having someone who you knew when you got to school would know that if that day you needed a little moment, you could take it or if you seemed a bit grumpy, it was okay. It, it was just that, it was being remembered because I think when mum died, you have like those two weeks where everyone's thinking of you, everyone's messaging, everyone's sending you, you emails and flowers and, and then the funeral passes and there is just such a lull of loneliness and because people go back to life, whereas yours is completely changed, so. Yeah, sorry, I went on a tangent, but that's where my brain was that's, going. <laughs> it's a beautiful tangent. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the lessons in the book is that grief is exhausting. Um, mm. I, I, was that, who, from whom did that come within the family? Or was that something you all felt? Probably each and every one of us, all of us, I think. It takes it out of you, I must say. It just, from the, from the bottom of your stomach, it just drains you completely. Um, and I think I say there's, there's like an oxymoron really in the book between you've got to put the pressure on them to keep up their schoolwork because you don't want that to fall behind for this. But on the other hand, you mustn't put the pressure on them to keep up their schoolwork because there's all this other stuff. You know, when they come back from school, they got, they're going through all sorts of levels of, of awfulness. So it, it's, it's a hard one to get right. And I think having there isn't a framework. So let's keep the conversations going. Let's let's mm -hmm. speak to the the parents, the carers, let's speak to the child, let's let's keep these communication going on an ongoing basis so we know what is best and when to put the pressure on, like we had with my son, when to take the pressure off, like with, with Olivia a little bit, when to when to distract. Um, you know, she went back to school. The first thing she when she went back to school was there was a it was um because it was we were talking about you know getting into the summer term or it was in the summer term, June. Um, so the school had had a like an activities week. So they were, there was some drama thing that she went back to do that. So there wasn't lessons, but there was that. So I went back into school. That that was the first time I'd gone back in after the after having to go and find Olivia. Um, uh, and that that was a distraction. It wasn't academic. It was theatre. But then I, people talked about the again. I don't know when people might be listening to this podcast, but we've just had the funeral of Prince Philip and the Queen sitting there on her own. In, a, in black with a black mask on and people saying how lonely it is but grief is incredibly isolating mm. she could have been surrounded by a thousand people and she would still be the loneliest woman in the world and I remember sitting in 
in for this this theatre event in the school hall, feeling like the loneliest person in the world. And no, yeah, people weren't talking to me, but they could have done. And their head teacher sort of just rolled, not rolled her eyes, but she looked sympathetic and she started crying and crossed the room. And the head of year just refused to speak to me. And and it was just it, it was lonely enough as it was. But then going there was even lonelier. And I was just just desperate to just grab hold of Olivia and just leave as quickly as I possibly could. So, so yeah, just just ask, just yeah. ask, just talk, just keep the communication going. Don't think, okay, we've set a path, that's it, because it could change. Because one week it could be something, and the next week it could be something else. So, just keep the communication going. And I know it's hard, and I know teachers are busy, but put you know, put, just put something in there. Put the anniversary in the diary, yeah. so that a year, in a year's time that you can just say, "Hi, Thebes, I know it's a rough day. How are you feeling? Or should we go and grab a cup of tea? Or just some connection, even if you." you end up the, the child steers you away from talking about the lost parent talks about the football or the whatever that it's okay it's connection that's what we in, in an isolating state um the, the 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 sense of connection the sense of people at least trying to reach out is is so is so helpful so put the anniversary remember the mother's day remember the birthdays the first the first year especially for all of these sorts of things but you know christmas um you know they're all all these anniversaries all these significant events count even the, some holidays you know they all they all have a resonance that's different now from 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 how they were before the nine plus one um just to sort of just while we're on the subject of that it's okay to be okay one of the first outings i had um was when a, a, a colleague of mine in independent thinking is also a, a he's a head teacher now and a good friend um jim smith um invited me to go and do some work in his school because he knew it would be a a friendly environment to go out and do that and we went out a few beers the night before and he'd lost his father quite young and I was saying um, that, that there won't be a 10 out of 10 moment anymore there won't be a, a wedding a birth a christening that that will be complete um, and he was saying but it no but it, it will be complete but in a different way so it won't be 10 that it'll be nine plus one out of ten and that that was such I came back and wrote nine plus one on the chalkboard that was in our kitchen and that sort of stayed with it will stay with you now Phoebe because you got the tattoo of it <laughs> oh really uh, yeah and, but, and we had my son's wedding um getting up well, a year and a half ago and that was the first real test of nine plus one and it was just the most wonderful complete day yeah. but in a nine plus one manner if you like and, and it's okay you can have wonderful complete happy experiences you, you you have the right to that you deserve that so you know births and weddings and and everything you deserve to have them complete they're just complete in a different way and i think that's that sharing that sense of hope and optimism and positivity and happy sad you know that the, the two can exist simultaneously it's not one or the other so and and, and that wedding was happy sad like yeah, a lot of things definitely most definitely you were going to say something before, Phoebe. <laughs> um, it was just going on to to back to you know, schools and, and teachers. And it, I think it would just be to remember that we haven't just lost a person. You don't just lose a person. There is a whole lot of traditions and a life and a place at the dinner table that has just gone. And I think if people can start to connect with that rather than just thinking, oh, you know, so-and-so lost their mum today. If you can connect with that, actually... I was going home then to one person less at the dinner table and one person less at Christmas and your birthday less that we would celebrate that year. I think if you can connect to all those things that we celebrate as humans, then you can start to feel it like in your heart and want to help that person and want to do what you can rather than just thinking, oh, I've, I don't really know what to say, so I'll just leave it. I'm sure she'll be fine and be getting support from anywhere else. Because if everyone thinks that you're supporting that person, no one will be you'll all be thinking the same thing it sounds a little bit as well like people didn't say or do the right things just because they were so worried they would get it wrong and that maybe yeah. just messy and clumsy and awkward is better than... you can't get it wrong there is no wrong mm. what was one of your cards phoebe i'm sorry your mum died love i'm sorry your mum's dead love yeah love amy or whoever it was and yeah and that was it you know it's that was something it was still something I look at it now and I just think that's just madness, isn't it? Just sorry your mum died. And it's just a little child's drawing. And if anything, it's you catch yourself laughing and then kind of catch yourself with that rock in your throat because it's sad. It's so young. 
but it was blunt and to the point and they didn't get it wrong they tried and that meant more yeah than nothing yeah and I think sometimes actually just saying it, it it yeah I think it is really important isn't it I think sometimes we dance around it and there's you know in the English language I talk a lot about how we should talk to children with special needs about death and I often find myself thinking well why don't we all talk about it this way because actually we say well you can't use all the euphemisms you've just got to talk about it really bluntly and simply and actually if we all have much more simple conversations about this yes it might feel a bit clumsy and awkward but at least we'd all be on the same page wouldn't we yeah that you know what I was thinking about the other day I work in a in a nursery in the cemetery and and I catch myself so many times because when we're walking through the cemetery obviously they sometimes go across stones and things and I catch myself going to say something but I know that my 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 co-workers wouldn't feel comfortable because it's just part of our society but part mm. of me thinks why shouldn't we anyone any of them could could lose someone tomorrow yeah. why do we dance around it we just need to help bring it up from when they're young so they can understand it maybe that's where you know the statistics come from maybe the people that are going down that route when they've lost someone is because they just don't understand it from a young age but maybe if we tried to help them it would be a lot less confusing I think there yeah. are cultural aspects to it as well I mean different cultures respond in in different yeah. ways I was uh, I, everything always happens for a reason I was just happened to be out earlier and then on BBC World Service was a half hour program all about why do we grieve what is the what is the genetic evolutionary reason for it and it was some guy in Australia who'd lost his cat and he was like I don't even like cats but I was in this so much pain for weeks and I'm an Australian man I was lost a cat I couldn't talk about it it was a very private thing but he was just he wrote to the BBC to this program crowd science to say can can you ask the experts why this happens and, and they were just pointing out the evolutionary nature of it that it that we you know in our past as human beings we needed to connect we needed to bond and if you lost somebody because they sort of went in a different direction as you're walking over the, the mountains or through the forest you 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 wanted to be able to remember them to be able to get them back mm -hmm. so this totally ridiculous thing of of going through so much pain that 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 can't it's not going to bring the person back so why does it exist but actually it's it's because we bond. It's because we. It's because we love. And this is how the program ended. You know, this lady was saying, and you know, I, I was with my husband for fifty years. My, my the pain that I feel at his death is awful and terrible, and is a result of fifty years worth of love, and and that's that's how it works. And there's a. I mean, it's a really corny Dolly Parton thing over Christmas, but she talks about grief is love with nowhere to go, mm -hmm. and and it just yeah that that works. That makes sense. You know, if yeah. if you didn't love, you wouldn't grieve. So. If, if the choice is no love and no grief back to the, the roller coaster and not the teacups you know you go go for the love and the pain that comes with it if, if that's what needs to happen yeah. yeah you said um earlier that you would talk a little bit about the winston swish uh research ian yeah um so we um the, the original book the little book of bereavement we uh royalties went to a um local hospice that had run a uh, Nikki's Way. Is that Nikki's Way? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, it's like a children's bereavement support group. So we sort of, for the first few years, we supported them. Um, but then I got, got involved with Winston's Wish, who are probably one of the, if not the leading children's uh, bereavement charities. And I do recommend checking out their, their resource and also their phone line, whether you're a child or a parent or a, or a teacher or any adult working with children, if you've got, if you've got a child facing grief, reach out to them they have so much good stuff um, so we started started sort of doing a little bit of work with them and um uh fergus crow their ceo is in the forward for the new book and uh, all royalties from the new version of the book are going to winston's wish now and we did a, a sort of a short launch video with them with phoebe um but it's just before COVID was all sort of kicking off um, um and they had commissioned some research from cambridge university because they were aware that when they went to look at what is the research on helping children with grieving there, there, there wasn't any or, or, or what there was was quite old so they commissioned cambridge university to do this report which is now fully available and i can send the link through to you Puki, so that you've got it you can add to the or people just put winston's wish cambridge you know grief research and they'll, they'll find it um but it, it pretty much showed the sorts of things that we were had experienced empirically but it also picked up from other little bits, little snippets of the research, that it's it's different things for different people, and there's so much of it is, you know, how do you how do you help the child? Well, it depends. 
it depends on the circumstances of the child's life beforehand. Was the child living in uh, poverty has an implication on how the child is best supported. Was the child living in chaos? Was the child going through a bit like we were with you know, mental health issues beforehand? Uh, and then the circumstances of the death, was it an accident? Was it sudden? Or was it a long-term or even a short-term, medium-term illness that the way you knew something was going to happen? Um, was it suicide? Uh, it wasn't in our case, uh, but when it is suicide, that has implications for the impact that it will then have going forward on the children and the rest of the family. So, it, uh, And then there are the cultural aspects to it as well, although I didn't teach you too much on culture. There are other areas in the book where we look at some of the cultural aspects and the research on, on grieving and loss. But it, it did show that there were, that it's exactly what Phoebe said, that you can't have a framework. You have to know, I was going to say this earlier, you have to know the child. And it, sympathy is easy. Mm-hmm. If somebody's in front of you crying, it's easy to say they're there. You don't walk away. Nobody walks away from a crying child. Empathy, I've always thought, the best definition is it's sympathy with imagination. Mm-hmm. You have to imagine what that person is going through and then act accordingly. So you know, I wonder what they, that child might be going home to at night at tea time tonight on this Tuesday night and in November or, or whatever. So, so what it takes is the empathy to be able to put yourself in that child's shoes before, during and after, and then think that child might need some help. And then the bravery to have those sorts of conversations mm-hmm. and also to know that it's that it could be part of your job. It's an interesting one because, you know, based on some of the stuff that's been going on on Twitter recently, for every five schools that are saying, yeah, we need to take mental health of our children seriously and we have a responsibility and we'll do everything we can, there's there's one or two that are just saying, that's not our responsibility. We're an academic school, we don't do, and I'm quoting here from a school we've had dealings with recently, we don't do that well-being nonsense. Uh, And I mentioned that on Twitter and that called all sorts of furore. I think I got the tone wrong um on that and and then because that school then had a what they called an unexplained suicide but it, you could clearly say that some people it was like well you blame your school I'm saying no, I'm not blaming school I'm just saying schools we're, we're there we're in loco parentis we can do something it might not be in your job description it might not be in your training it might not be what Ofsted are looking for it might not get you to the top of the league table um but surely we have a, some sort of ethical, moral and professional responsibility. If we can do something that we do that thing, whatever that thing might be. And I think that's 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 the bit. And, and, and you can walk away. You can cross the road. You can say, well, or send a bunch of flowers and move on. But the, if you believe that your job involves an element of well-being, which involves an element of empathy and understanding and connection, then then do your job. And, and we're also, there is research that shows when you get the well-being right, their academic results go up anyway. So, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's a double win. Anyway, don't worry about the exam results by focusing on the well-being. Absolutely. And, and going back to that idea around connection takes us in a beautiful Radio 2 style link to Kuchi Care, Phoebe. So it'd be nice to kind of, as we're, we're getting towards the end of our time, just hearing a bit about where you are and what you're doing now and, and just tell us a bit about what Kuchi Care is and what you're hoping to achieve with it and what, what that looks yeah. like. Um, so it was originally inspired by, by of course, the loss um, and when... When we lost mum, there was absolutely nothing. There was nothing around. There still is nothing until Kutchy Care, really. Um, that just gives a child what they need most. And it is genuinely just a big cuddle. Um, so that is what's really kind of inspired Kutchy Care. Um, and also taking it into schools over the next year, hopefully, if COVID decides to calm down. Um, taking it into schools and you know setting up kuchi corners where children can have a safe space to leave leave the classroom just 10 minutes I'd much rather have had 10 minutes an option to leave just to recollect my thoughts have that awful puddly moment and then go back than have wanted to leave for the whole day Mm. and just go home and have a puddly day rather than a puddly moment Um, and so that was kind of where the inspiration of kuchi care came from and then with COVID and everything, now everyone needs a cuddle. <laughs> now everyone is is like bereaved in in some sense. We've lost, you know, a year of our lives. We've not been able to see family. We've lost, you know, our own routines that we used to have. 
Um, so it's all about being able to kind of send the cuddle to the people that you miss most. So currently I've got a bereavement hamper box for a child, someone that's bereaved, um, which is kind of bought by the parent or the caregiver or the guardian. Um, and you can work through this. With the child, so you've got Winston's Wish resources, we've got memory jar that you can have, that you can fill lovely memories of the, the loved one and hold on to them, which I wish I had done, um, really, because you can have as many memories as you can try and hold on to. And then when it's 13 years later, it's kind of more pictures, really, that you remember. Um, we've got a gravity blanket in there and then lots of other little comforting bits. Um, and then the other box is for uh, bereaved adults due to COVID. And the more recent one is just a big cuddle in a box that you can send to someone you love. So that's, that's mainly it really, just supporting those who have lost and supporting those who need, who need it most really. Explain a cuddle in a box. <laughs> Pardon? Explain a cuddle in a box. I've got a very weird thing in my head of, you, you know, a, a, a box being delivered and you jumping out and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> almost almost yeah well that's that's the aim but so the main part of the cuddle and the whole kutch comes from for me the the weighted gravity blanket um so it's all about just having that time to just spend with yourself have this lovely gravity blanket have the calming balm have the hot water bottle just take time for yourself and have a moment cuddle yourself so in in covid times we haven't been able to cuddle anyone else so let's just learn to cuddle ourselves um, so that's where the cuddle in the box kind of comes from. And, and yeah, I can't go around and give every bereaved child, adult or someone struggling during this time a big cuddle, although I wish I could because I do love a cuddle and it's not, we're not able to at the minute because of COVID, but that's, that's where it comes from really. And there's a sad lamp in there and then there's a yeah. frame for photos and yeah. you're going to deal with a local company where there's, there's a mug with hot chocolate and chocolates yeah. and yeah. Soaps and balms and <laughs> multi-sensory. <laughs> the whole the thing, box. the whole thing. So we launched it uh, a few weeks ago, which was just one of those moments where I just thought this is not going to happen. It's just silly idea, silly me. And then we got an order of 100 boxes in the first 24 hours from wow. a, lovely, a lovely care company that want to look after their carers who have been looking after people during COVID. So it, it proves that I'm, I'm doing something right and I, I want to put my pain from losing mum into something. And it, it gives me enough distance that I can help people that have gone through similar, yeah. but not have to relive it every day. Because I think at one point I thought that's it, I want to be, you know, social worker or agreement specialist, but I, I want to do what I can in a way that still allows me to live and not relive that loss every day. That's incredibly sensible. Thank you. <laughs> you must be really proud of Arian. You, yeah, you have no idea. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's an amazing thing. And she's, I mean, she she went for, to Prince's Trust uh, for some of the support for that. And, um, but so much of it is just, she's just done off her own back. You know, she's, I'm an entrepreneur, I've set up my own company. She could have turned to me for lots of stuff and, and she hasn't. She's done it her own, her own thing in her own way. And it's just, it looks incredible and I, I'm incredibly proud. And the, the idea that you can get a booking of a hundred within 24 hours. And you said there's another care company that's looking for 200 and you'll need a warehouse. I took photos or she sent photos surrounded in her flat by all these gravity blankets and doing soap and all sorts of things. And I sent her a picture of um, Anita Roddick and our black and white room from the whenever that was end of the 60s early 70s of her in her first store uh saying that people start in that the body shop people you know there will be everybody starts in this way you start with a pile of stuff in a bit of space and you go on from there and it's it, it it's it's done with such heart as well when you describe you envisage phoebe leaping out and giving somebody a cuddle that, <laughs> that's exactly what it is almost exactly what it is <laughs> what a perfect idea as well though because actually i uh, it, it is hard to know what to do and what to say when someone yeah. dies and actually being it it's not uh, it's not the end of the conversation is it sending something like that but it's a very very good way of making a decent start isn't it yeah definitely. Um, it would show yeah it would show that you care and give you a starting point for some of those conversations Definitely. Oh, well, we'll link through to that in the show notes as well, so that people can uh, can can have a look. And uh, oh yeah, that'd be lovely. Uh, Thank you. Next order. It's a, what a wonderful, wonderful way to turn such a very difficult thing into something really positive, and um, hoping that it makes things feel a little bit different for some people. Oh yeah, me too. 
So what I, I warned you at the beginning, I'd ask you at the end for a final thought. Um, what, what thought would you, maybe if we start with you, Phoebe, what thought would you like to leave people with as we come to a close? Um, I think I've got two thoughts that have been going on. The first one is if you are, if you are dealing with someone who has just lost someone that they love, you can, you can be there, there is no wrong. Just be there talk encourage them to talk because I think talking has been one of the biggest healers even if they don't want to it it helps and more importantly listen you don't always have to come back with your own story just be be the ears let us rant and just explode and have a cry and and just listen and I think the other thing is if you are the one that's bereaved and you're struggling is there is so much life after loss and and I hope that as someone who lost someone at nine with all the statistics that say I shouldn't have shouldn't be here I have so much life left to live at this moment and I feel it more than ever now especially with where I'm kind of channeling all this loss into yeah there is just so much life after death and loss and just know that you you can do it you'll be okay beautiful and Ian what thought would you like to give people with oh it's hard to hard to compete with Phoebe on that <laughs> I, I think it's it's the ongoing nature of it. Um, you know, so Phoebe was nine and, and you said earlier, Pookie, that you know, in many ways she was like ideally placed to experience it fully. But, and she did as a nine-year-old. But then the difference between a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old experiencing grief is, diff- is, is, is more extreme difference than a 18-year-old and a 25-year-old, for example. So so the way that I've always defined it or described it is it's a bit like Phoebe sort of leaving the coast and as she goes for sailing further in, in, into the sea looking back the, the land is getting bigger so she's seeing more of the picture which means she's got more of the questions and is experiencing it each year almost in a different way and and and, and equally hard each time it wasn't like coming to terms with one thing that then, I don't know, fades or changes over time. It was, it, every year it was slightly different because she saw more of the landscape and had more of the questions about why was it like that and why is it like that and why are people doing this? So it, it was that sense of ongoing change and pain. And then from my perspective as the father, especially because then, I mean, Phoebe talked about being in 16 different schools. It was because we traveled. It wasn't because she'd get, get getting kicked out. Yeah. Honestly, we have to put that there because we sort of, we traveled a bit within England before um, uh, before Leslie died. And then when I remarried and then we, we sort of traveled and went around the world, that was why all these changes. So, and schools, yeah, they, they didn't, they didn't always grasp that they were taking this on board, even though we were very open about it. I remember having a conversation quite early on, or more of an argument really in Hong Kong saying, you know, Phoebe chooses to be happy. It's that she chooses today. I'm, I'm, I could be sad, but I'm not going to. I'm going to choose to be happy. And I think that's incredible. And I wanted them to know that that's because she chose to be happy. It doesn't mean to say we didn't need the care and the support and the understanding because it's really hard. It's really hard because on a day she chooses to be happy at night, she's crying her eyes out and, and I need help with that. And she needs help with that. So it's that it's that ongoing awareness of what children are going through and what their families are going through and the role that schools can play. Just and just it, it can be an email, it can be a sentence, it can be a smile, it can be a hug when that's allowed. It's just little things that show connection. There's that, that word again. Mm-hmm.